to the office calling him at H.C. Campbell. Show was packed with news, author interviews, that's was all about you, the author. And now here's our host, H.C. Campbell. Hi, welcome to the office center with H.C. Campbell, Special Black Comic Book Edition. As always, I'm your host, H.C. Campbell. I'm standing in front of Star Clipper right here on the University City Loop right here in St. Louis. And I'm here because I want to talk about profiling some of the best black comic book writers and artists in my world, as well as three very powerful interviews as the office corner can bring you. I'm going to start off with Mama Boy's creator, Jerry Kraft. Then I'm going to talk to Superhero Huff herself, Girlie Huff, and her Superhero Huff model. Then finally, we'll be talking to Yul Tolbert of Time Like Two. So when we come back, we're going to take a tour of Star Clipper, talk to a few people, and we're going to talk to Mom Boy creator Jerry Kraft. But first, here's some black comic book facts for you. Born 1917, who created such characters like Captain America and the X Men, believed that African Americans weren't represented in comic books. So he created the Black Panther in June 1966, an African warrior and tribal leader who protects his land, Wakanda, from outsiders. The name predates the October 1966 founding of the Black Panther Party, and both messages were similar, whether in fiction or in real life. The character is so iconic and recognized that he was in story arcs where he defeated the Fantastic Four and joined the Avengers. This led to the birth of other black superheroes like Luke Cage in the Hero for Hire comics and the Falcon, sometimes sidekick to Captain America. Pass off to Jack Kirby, who is a pioneer when it comes to African American characters. Have you checked out the author's corner lately? It's the best show you're not watching. Every two weeks we bring you author interviews, news, and the best of the industry. With special guests, it's no wonder it's the fastest growing show around. There are two ways to check me out. Log on to my website at www.hdcampbell3.net or my YouTube channel at hdcampbell1230. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. So you believe the Bruce Williams story is included in How to Lose a Black Woman? Well, Bruce Williams begs to differ. Find out what's been going on with Bruce Williams in the sequel titled Geraldine, coming soon. Do you need a manuscript edited? Perhaps you need a press kit or some ghostwriting done. HD Camera Productions will offer the most professional services at the best price. We also do book trailers, publicity, newsletters, and more. Check out more in the online marketplace section on my website at www.hdcampbell3.net. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Welcome back to the Office Corner with H.D. Campbell. Welcome back to the Office Corner with H.D. Campbell. As always, I'm your host, H.D. Campbell. Um, I want to give you a quick tour of Star Clipper. There's a lot of amazing items here. There's clothes, there's graphic novels, there's comic books. For a comic book nerd myself, this is what they call heaven, like basically in the Big Bang Theory. Uh, we'll pick up here to uh, where they have the newer things. They've got everything from Transformers to Wolverine is going to have a new uh, movie soon. Uh, there's going to be so much in the world of comic books that's going on right now. And so many writers and so many artists. I want to take a moment here. A lot of the black comic book writers and artists, like Dwayne McDuffie and quite a few others that uh, have contributed to the game a lot. There's a whole lot of selection here, and uh, I want to start off with Mama's Boy's creator. Jerry. I'm talking to, I'm talking to Mama's Boy's creator and writer and illustrator Jerry Kraft. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for talking to the office corner. I really appreciate it. No problem. All right. Um, well, as in all stories with, with people I interview, I want to start at the beginning. Um, what actually influenced you to want to write and draw comics? Well, for, well, first tell me what age were you then? Oh, you know what? As a matter of fact, since you asked, uh, I got something I can actually show you while I'm doing this. But All right. from the time that I can remember, I just always 
love to draw. And um, I remember when I was pretty young, and I'd say about the fifth grade, even though I drew before then, but I think fifth grade was about the time when I started making my own comic books. Before that, I was actually the kid sitting in the back of the classroom, like many of us, that, um, you know, doodling in the notebook and stuff like that. And I was going through some stuff not long ago and found some old homework assignments and tests. And this mm -hmm. is one that I probably did in about the oh. grade or so. Nice. So the, the paper is all old and yellow, but this is like making up uh, my little superhero characters. Nice. And then from there, the next step was actually creating my own comic book. So I would just get the regular typing paper, as they called it at that time. No one mm -hmm. called it typing paper anymore. Mm -hmm. And then uh, make my own comic book. So this is probably one of the first comic books I ever did. Wow. About 10, 12 pages. And I like taking this and showing it to kids because, you know, a lot of them look at the stuff that I do now and they're like, oh, I can't do that. And my thing was, I couldn't do this either, you know, when, when I was your age. Um, and I see some kids now that are really good. And they may be in fourth grade or fifth grade. And I said, well, look at what you're doing now and look at what I did. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why if you practice and work as hard as I did, uh, that you can't even be better than um, what I was. So that's one of the reasons why I always carry this around with me. Um, but literally, I used to make little comic strips, comic books, and I got better and better through high school. And in college, I had a friend of mine that worked at a copy shop, so I started getting them bound, you know, a nice little wow. art cover and stuff like that, uh, until I finally had my first printed book, which was in 1997. This is the first Mama's Boys book. Nice. That I did that I was able to uh, publish on my own. Okay. Well, actually, that, actually, that was going to actually deviate to my next question. What was your influence for Mama's Boys? You know, I used to see comic strips. Um, you know, I always liked them. Uh, I remember seeing the Charlie Brown cartoons um, on TV, but then I also liked the comic strips. Um, it was also really cool to see some of the ones featuring African-American characters. So mm -hmm. I would see We Pals by Maury Turner. Um, that was one of the first ones I remember. Mm -hmm. And that was in the newspapers and on TV. Mm -hmm. And then um, Luther by Grumpy Brandon. Uh, Quincy was mm -hmm. another one. And those are all pretty inspirational. So, you know, people don't realize how important it is to see characters that look like yourselves, especially Go ahead. You know, you can't put the uh, importance of the value of kids seeing characters that look like themselves, um, that represent them in a way that's positive. Um, and that's that's one of the things that when I saw these comic strips, uh, they were all really well done. They were funny, but they were they were kids like how I was or how I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that I wanted to, to do as I got older. Um, initially, I wanted to do more of a Spider-Man kind of comic book because I was a real big Spider-Man uh, yeah. fan, so I wanted to work for Marvel at that point. As I got in college, I started to see some of the uh, more modern comic strips like uh, Curtis by Ray Billingsley, uh, maybe Jumpstart by Rob Armstrong, Herb and Jamal, um, mm -hmm. you know, Later on Where I'm Coming From by Barbara Brandon. So those were actually showing me that people that were my age or maybe a little, a little older, uh, where they were going and showing me, okay, these are actually people just like me, so I can actually do something like that. And so from there, it was just kind of a, a natural progression to me trying it myself and then kind of learning the ropes. Okay, okay. Now, you said that um, you were trying to uh, get into one of the establishment companies. What kind of roadblocks did you have? What kind of role models? No, what type, no, what type of roadblocks did you have getting to the uh, establishment companies? Oh, roadblocks. You know, um, my superhero stuff was never probably on the level 
of uh, making it to a Marvel or DC. So I'm not going to lie and say, oh, well, you know, I was blacklisted or, you know, something like that. Um, as I got older, like I said, I got more into humorous illustration. Mm -hmm. Although I did do, believe it or not, I did do a couple of um, books for Marvel, but nice. they were not superhero books. Right. Um, they were actually kind of um, almost like an Archie book that Marvel had uh. a girl's line for a while. So I worked with a woman named Barbara Slate, and she developed some... She developed a title called um, Sweet Sixteen. So my my big entry into Marvel Comics wow. was the Sweet Sixteen book. So this is about a uh, a girl who was a, a princess back in ancient Rome, and she um, you know like an Archie kind of thing. Cool. And uh, Barbara Slate hired me to do that, and I also did for Harvey. I did some New Kids on the Block comics uh. um so i actually did get some some comic work done like i said it was just never the superhero stuff i got you i got you well since we're on the subject uh who are your role models for the superhero um you know i grew up really liking jim steranko mm. uh john busema uh gil kane was one of my favorites these were all marvel guys i didn't buy any dc books mm -hmm. um I remember Mike Renatz, it was a, a Michael Golden. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, people like that. And uh, John Byrne. So those are guys that I would look at constantly and really kind of try to emulate their style. Um, you know, not, not too great, but you know, I, I tried it. Um, so when it came time to doing a comic strip, um, you know, I developed my characters and I would send it around. And I actually started by self-publishing. So I started out at like local papers uh, in New York City. And I got a real local one, which is pretty cool. That was my first one. And from there, I reached out to a bigger one, which is the City Sun, which was kind of a rival to the Amsterdam News back in the day. So that was actually a nice one. And they picked me up. So from there, I was just like, well, I could take it national if I want to sell it. Um, I started approaching other newspapers, got picked up in the Broward Times in, in uh, um, Florida, uh, the St. Louis American, Houston Sun. So mm -hmm. that was my progression of starting self syndicate. And then finally got picked up weekly by King Features, and I was there, you know, from I guess 1995, so about 15, 16 years, something like that. Right. Well, King Fe yeah, King Features is a big deal, and I'm talking about way from, I mean, way back in, so yeah, that, that that's a pretty big company, so yeah, it, yeah. it's pretty cool. So, um, tell yeah, me... King Features does, you know, Bill Bailey and Hagar the Horrible and mm -hmm. Blondie, and, you know, they've yep. had strips that have been going since, you know, 1933, and then they, you know, they release a couple of new ones each year. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely one of the oldest and largest of the comics of syndicates. So I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm going to take a moment and show everyone your website here for a second, where they get to learn more about you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, JerryCraft.net. That's my uh, my newer one. I had MamaSports.com for years, but JerryCraft.net actually has my comic strips. You know, it has the Mama's Boys, and it also has a bunch of the children books that I do. It has some of the flash animation I did when I was working at the Sports Illustrated for Kids website, as well as some of the, the personal ones I've done. Um, and it's just basically taking stuff from, from all of the, the different places where I worked in different projects and putting it together so you can get kind of a, a wide array of the stuff that I work on. Okay. Well, now I want to get out of the realm of Jerry Craft, the writer, I want writer illustrator. I want to now talk about the family that is Mama's Boys. Tell me about Mama's Boys. Family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's funny because um, when I so this is the first book. So this is Mama's Boys as American the Sweepers Hit a Pop. Mm -hmm. And it features the main characters are Mom. And she's raising her two teenage sons, Yusuf, who's 16, 
Tyrell's was 18. And then there's a, an uncle, Uncle Grego, and the grandfather. And I knew when I, I first created it, um, I kind of wanted to base it on a lot of my friends who I was growing up with. I was one of the few that actually had my mom and my dad there. Most of my friends lived with either their mother or their grandmother. That's who they were raised by. So I wanted to do something that was kind of, you know, paying respect to these moms that were raising kids like this. Um, it wasn't really as prevalent as it is today. You know, if I were creating this stuff today, I don't think I would do that. Mm -hmm. But for back then, that was what I wanted, I wanted to do. And, you know, it was interesting because I got um, a forward by Lynn Johnston, who does the For Better, For Worse comic strip, which is really one of the most popular comic strips ever. And here's actually a nice little cool hmm. shot of my characters and her characters from from the uh, from her strip. Wow. And I got, you know, I got good press. I got write-ups in uh, comic journal, uh, cartoons profile, all these different kind of mainstream outlets. And I figured with Lynn Johnson, you know, her name attached, that sales-wise I would do pretty good. And I probably did not get a single sale from all of those. And wow. that was when I started to think that maybe trying to do the mainstream route was not really uh, what I should be doing. So from there, I started more like, okay, well, obviously it looks like my audience would be the African-American audience, and I started to focus uh, on them. And that's when I actually started to, to, you know, get the readership and the popularity. And then when I would do book fairs, people would come over and they say, hey, you know, can I get this for my 10-year-old son? Hmm. And I never thought of it as a kid's book, you know, because I always liked comic strips when I was an adult and a lot of my friends were in the business, so I'm thinking I'm writing it for you and me, mm -hmm. um, and not like a 10-year-old. But then they'd ask, and I said, well, I guess there's nothing bad in there, so yeah, I guess you can. And then these people start buying it for the kids, and the kids would take it and just whiz right through it. And um, like, oh, you know, my kids love it, I'm like, really? So then that's what what happened. You know, I, I got a write up in Great Books Back to the American Children and all of a sudden I had this audience that I never had considered previously. And it was probably good that I that it went that way because if I had started out doing a kids comic strip, I think I might have lowered the, the humor and maybe talked down to them a little bit or made it a little easier. Um as a result, I think one of the things that the kids like is, you know, coming up to the level of the strip. And the parents like that, too, because I never talk down to the kids. And it's the old Fat Albert school of, you know, coming away with life lessons. So exactly. hopefully they, they laugh, exactly. but they also learn about different things. So I've, I've done all kinds of topics in the comic strip. Okay. Uh, before I go on my next question, I just wanted to make a comment real fast. Um, you mentioned, you know, you know, you never thought of it as a kid's comic or what have you. I'll tell you, as in my growing up, and it doesn't matter whether it's Mama's Boys or Superhero or whatever it is, kids love watching. Love, kids love reading about kids just like them. Yeah. You know, kids who think the way they think, kids who do the way they do. You know, you know, so basically for us, you know, young black kids, we definitely, you know, we definitely love something like that. You know what I mean? So. Oh, absolutely. I remember um, going to the movies, and I don't even remember how old I was, but seeing The Last Dragon in the theater. Ah, yeah, love that movie. And that just, I mean, the bond that I felt for that movie, because, you know, they had never done anything with, you know, black people liking karate movies. Yep. <laughs> you know, it was filmed in Harlem. You know, and, and the slang was like, you know, it wasn't, hey, you jive turkey and 
exactly. 30 years ago, so it was what was current at that time. And um, I was just amazed. I was like, wow, you can do that? You know, because everything up until then was like this really kind of, you know. Mm, stereotypical black exploitation yeah. type of thing, yeah. So I was amazed by that. So to, you know, to, to try to emulate and put that stuff into my work so that when, when people read this strip, they're like, oh, I know someone like that, or that made me laugh because I do the same thing, or even have parents laugh and say, mm -hmm. yeah, my son is just like that or whatever. So I, I think that that's really something that I like to do a lot. See, that's the other thing that I like about it, too. Um, you know, there's no over-the-top stereotypical you know, genre is exactly how you would act or I would act. It's like, hey, I know somebody that acts mm -hmm. like that, so yeah, so. So. Yeah, and, and usually what happens is, um, and this is a whole nother topic, but in, in our audience sometimes, we are actually the ones that embrace those negative stereotypes um, and defend it. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, not not too bad, like, you know, a lot of the urban lit and stuff, but whenever I go to a signing or I hear someone speak and someone will get up and say, well, you know, why is it all about the thugs and the gangsters and all that? And somebody always gets up, I read, like, well, I know people like that. I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure you know people that aren't like that, too. Exactly. You know, I mean... But they defend that more vehemently than, you know, something like, you know, Fred Albert or Eggs, right. when, when they, uh, they had the Cosby show. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a black doctor growing up. So I did too. I said, yeah, I do know someone like that, but people weren't doing that. Like, oh, that's unrealistic. A black doctor and a black lawyer, that's unrealistic. I'm like, you know, they were black lawyers. I actually have a black attorney, so yeah, so you know, they, 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 they exist. Johnny Cochran, he's a black lawyer. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Ultimatix and C. Brennan Mason back in the day and stuff like that. So it did happen, but we don't always uh, um, embrace those guys and defend those, but we look at some of the negative stuff and go, oh, yeah, that, that's about what I expect from us. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, big kudos to uh, you and Mama's Boys, because again, again, and I know, I know, I know you're not the first, and you definitely won't be the last, but you're part of the solution. I'll just put it like that. You're definitely part of the solution. Oh, I appreciate that. It means a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, too, before before I get into get into other things that uh, you're into, I've I've noticed something about you in my research and from this interview. Now, you're a teachable person. You. Um, like for example, you when you told me earlier about the kid that said I can't do that, and you and you talk to him and say, well, yeah, you can. I mean, and I see you when you when you do these shows, you do more like teaching than you do selling. So I actually do. I I did the school in actually I did like five school visits last week. By the end of the week, I was wet. <laughs> you know, but you know, I did one school. Um, I I probably saw about 600 kids wow. that day. I had an assembly and I had about four classes afterwards. And I do actually show them, you know, these are the steps that I took. And also, you know, I'm not Superman, you know. I actually did not like to read when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And that's something that surprises a lot of kids because they thought, you know, I was a bookworm because I'm a writer now. And it was, it was the opposite. And I think that a lot of it was I just did not find anything besides comic books that I could relate to or that I was interested in. And even with the comic books, you know, you take them to school, the teachers would take them. Yeah, right. You know, Had plenty taken. And mm -hmm. end of the year, you know, you look at the teacher's desk, and it would look like, you know, Forbidden Planet, you know, like when the, the comic book shops, because they had so many right. comics in there. <laughs> so, you know, for them to say, hey, I see you reading, 
but I don't approve of what you're reading, so I'm going to take it from you, I think really emphasized that reading could not be fun for me, that it had to be a chore. And mm -hmm. I think once that happens, you lose readers, because if I didn't have to read, then I wasn't going to, because, you know, reading to me was the teacher saying, okay, well, tonight I need you to read chapters 18 through 34, and you're like, oh, oh God, God. right. <laughs> Not even like I didn't want to, but how, how can you physically read, you know, 16 chapters by tomorrow? So it was, it was a lot. Um, and then it wasn't until I was really an adult that um, I started reading actual books. You know, I mean, I read the paper and stuff like that, but books on my own. Um, and then a lot of them were like, you know, kind of books on, on learning flash animation or Photoshop or something like that. And then um, I tell people now, I, I met Eric Jerome Dickey, and we swapped books. Right. And I knew I had to read his books because he's going to ask me what I thought of them. Mm -hmm. And I read them, I was like, hey, this is cool. Right. And then I, mm -hmm. I read another, and then, you know, some of the other books that I had heard people talk about for years, the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, uh, Invisible Man, books like that, then I started going back and reading, and that's really what kind of set me in motion. Well, um, quick aside, you know, going to my next question. Um, what a lot of people don't, well, what, what, what a lot of teachers don't realize is things like comic books are a child's first real book to read. You know, and again, some teachers get it, some teachers don't. My son's teacher gets it. So my son's um, so, uh, are you developing any other characters right now? Yeah, actually, right now I'm doing a few things. I'm, I'm going to bed at like 2 a.m. and waking up at about 6, you know. Um, one of the things that I do is I, I work with other authors to help them publish their books, so I illustrate and help them publish. So there, there are a couple things now that I'm doing. Um, I've got three books at the printer now. One of them is written by a doctor. Uh, they took me on. It's called My Surgery. It's, it's about, you know, kids that are going to the hospital having surgery for the first time. Hmm. Um, so a lot of the people that I work with are not people who, you know, consider themselves professional authors but have a story that they want to tell. And I really like doing that because they're very passionate about it. So, for example, this doctor really sees the importance of trying to comfort kids when they go into the hospital. This is one, um, What's Below Your Tummy Tum, which is written by a licensed social worker named Michelle Brito. And that she wanted to do something to get kids to, to teach them to, how important it is to keep their private parts private. Um, Very so this important. Is a, a kids book that will that will do that. Um, one of the books that I did last year, um, Who Would Have Thunk It with George and Emma Frazier, I actually just notified today that it is now an Amazon bestseller. Wow. So we're about to put the little label on there, the little tag, and and print that out. And this is about um, the foster care system. George and Emma Frazier were two kids who um, survived, the, well not survived, but um, went through the foster care system and actually flourished, I'll say. Yeah. And then they wanted to kind of comfort um, all the kids that are in the same position. Um, that's the kind of thing I do. I'm working on one now just because by Chiquita Camille, who is really cool. It, it's like a family that likes to be together, you know, and that, that's really a nice warm bond with that. So that's one that, you know, if you see my drawing table in the background, I've got mm -hmm. all kinds of original artwork that I've been working on. I uh, see. A couple of weeks. Got a lot of it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, one of them is, is the, a mom, Sabrina Carr, that she did. I've done three for her. Um, please don't yell at we. 
Please don't <laughs> to me and my hair is curly. So I love again, it. these are for younger kids that, um, you know, it, like, again, she's passionate. She wants to do it for kids, but also for the parents to be like, well, you know, remember that your kids are little and they like to run and jump, get dirty. So take a second before you yell, you know? Exactly. Really remember that, that. So it's for the parents and the kids. Okay. Um, as far as for my own, um, I've got a couple things that I'm working on. One of them um, is a, and these are um, middle grade novels. So not illustrated, you know, some illustration. This one is called The Offenders. And <laughs> this would be out probably in about a month. I love it. And I like the cover. This is a group of kids who are bullies, school bullies. Mm -hmm. But when they turn into their super alter egos, they actually kind of emulate the kids that they bully, and then they get teased. So instead of being like really cool Spider-Man, Silver Surfer, wow. all that, um, you know, they em emulate, like I said, the, the kids that they bully, and then they get teased. So it's really kind of their comeuppance, and it's. Um, to me, a really good way to kind of teach the kids about bullying because a lot of times we'll emphasize um, the kids who are um, being bullied, but this one really also takes a look at the kids who are the bullies. Um, Khalil's Way is one I did with David Miller, and he is a kid that has a bully problem. And this one is really also done well um, he gets a lot of school visits and, and things like that to bring his message across. And last but not least, uh. my teenagers, and this is a superhero. He is 17, growing up in Harlem, mm -hmm. and he and his dad uh, are trying to devise a way to combat some of the elements uh, in that area. But it's not just about, you know, kicking butt and taking names because, you know, some of these guys, you can beat them down so often that it doesn't even matter to them anymore. But right. it's also about trying to change them mentally and how their outlook is on life. And it's called Positive Force. That's his name. That's also, you know, what he is. So this is one that, although when I talk to a lot of um, publishers, they seem to think that spending time to write a book for African-American teenage boys is kind of a, a waste of time because, you know, they don't read, is what they say. Um, I am hard-headedly going to do this and see for myself because, like I was saying, you know, I mean, I've got two teenage boys who are 15 and 13. Mm -hmm. They like to read, but they're like, Dad, I don't want to read Twilight. You know, exactly. Or something like that. Um, so by giving them this kid, I mean, you see, first of all, he's in a hoodie. Right. You know, uh, the, this actually, the illustration was done by my brother, Mishindo uh, Kumba, who is amazing. Like, I would not have done this myself. So I was like, let me hire him to do that because I, I definitely had a look in my mind that I wanted that I didn't think that I would be able to capture and I knew he would because he's one of the, the best out there yeah. um, so those are kind of the things I've got in the next coming month uh, um, definitely need the support because like I said a lot of people are like yeah there are no books for our black teenage boys so you know those of us that are out there doing it, uh, also like David Walker at the Super Justice Force. It's really important um, to be embraced and that we can do this because not only do we have a, a goal, but I mean, it is a business deal too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, okay, you know, do I get this for myself or, you know, fix up the car, do this, or do I publish this other book that has this you know, bigger uh, impact on more people than just myself, so we'll see. Okay. Yeah, because uh, quick thing, um, that's the problem. 
um, again, we talk about the reading thing. There's nothing for teenage boys to read, so I, w I would actually like to see that on the market. So, so yeah, just keep pushing forward with it. Uh, my next question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and it's also you know those of us that are independent publishers, you know, it's very tough to do the the bookstore route, you know, because. Uh, instead of the being in the action side or, you know, wherever it is, you know, they're jammed into the actual interest, which could, you know, be in between a cookbook by Oprah and, uh, you know, uh, something else. So, you know, you don't really get the play that you would. So, you know, I think it's really important to find ultimate means of getting to your audience and we we've got to really be creative uh in order to do that i mean we really do a change we really do need some change with that big time um my next question um have you ever have you ever got approached or ever thought about doing television about what about doing television so i mean that that's definitely a goal I think that um, the way that my uh, Mommy's Boy's comics is written, you know, again, going back to the Fat Albert School where there's some thoughts behind it and a, a good intent and teachable moment, and you don't really see that no, anymore, yeah. you know. Uh, with the, the, the South Park and, exactly. you know, American Dad, Family Guys, and, you know, not that they aren't funny and I'm definitely not bashing and stuff. That's not what I want to do. Um, so stuff that actually has an, an impact. You know, it would really take somebody with some vision to say, okay, we will support you with this. Because uh, that's not something I can do on my own. Right. You know, so I know there's a backlash so of all the cartoons, and some of the ones I, you know, I see my kids watch, I'm like, hey, come on. Hmm. That is so stupid. Absolutely. And also the message that most of them, you know, the adults are just idiots. <laughs> they are, exactly. It's like, really? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would definitely need some help with that, but it is, it is definitely a goal. Okay. Well, my, my final question is, what advice do you have for anyone who's starting out where you are now? What, you know, um, that, that sixth grade kid, that, um, the adult, the, the adult who wants to start out, what, what advice do you have for them? Well, I think it's, the biggest thing is you can never stop learning. You know, I've been doing this 140 years, something like that. And, uh, you know, there's so much stuff. Like, I, I was talking to a guy yesterday who gave me tips on color. Hmm. You know, um, I remember showing Machindo uh, something that I had done. And he's like, so, well, where's your light sauce, brother? I'm like... I don't know. Mm -hmm. Light sauce. He's like, look, you take this drawer, and now if the lights come from here, then there'd be a shadow here, but not here, and then the highlight would be here. Uh, and I was like, wow. I mean, that's <laughs> something I had thought about. And being able to um, learn like that, and if you go on YouTube, there is so much stuff. Photoshop and InDesign and watercolor and whatever sometimes while i'm working i'll just put those on so don't stop learning that's one uh you can learn from anyone because you know sometimes i'll show something um to someone to go oh well i can't criticize it because i'm not a cartoonist i'm like well i didn't do this for cartoons i did it for you know regular consumers so if you don't get a joke i know that i've got to go back and change it you know, so it's not, you don't need credentials, you know. Um, and then practice, and then get it out there, too. Um, 
because so many creators are like just so paranoid about their stuff being stolen that they never left outside the house. And it's like, okay, well, you gotta publish it or send it somewhere or learn to do it yourself or get it in a local newspaper. But they're like, oh, I need the copyright and I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And it's like, listen, get it out there, work it, you know, um, and just make it as good as you can. You know, check it, make sure it's professional. The spelling is good. You know, um, you don't want to spend all this money for the book and you're misspelling names and typos and people look and they're like, you know, yeah, he really should have saved his money. You know? So that, that's, that's, those are the main thing I would say. Exactly. Um, I want to thank you. Um, before we go, is there, is there besides your website, is there any other places your fans can uh, get in contact with you? Yeah, I mean the big thing is Jerry Craft dot net, and that's Jerry with a J Craft C R A F T dot net. Um, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, like all those traditional ones, and it's always just my name, Jerry Craft. Okay. And um, you know, I I get a lot of emails, but I do my best to respond uh, in a fairly timely manner. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm accessible. I hope you had a great time listening to uh, Jerry Craft and tell his tale of his story. He is but one of many we're going to have on this show. When we come back, we're going to have Girlie Huff and her partner, Superhero Huff herself. They talk about their journey into the comic book life. Dwayne McDuffie is an African-American writer and artist born in Detroit, February 20th, 1962. He was a known fixture in both the black and mainstream comic book industry and a rising star merging both together. He was best known for creating the television show Static Shop, as well as writing and producing for popular cartoons like Justice League Unlimited and Ben Penn. He started his career working special projects at Marvel Comics. Then he worked for Archie and Hobby Comics before developing his own brand, Milestone Comics. Milestone is a brand which features African-American heroes like Static Shock, as well as Asian and Latino heroes. Eventually merging with DC Comics, Dwayne created a diversity unlike any other. He went on to write in both comics and for cartoons like What Do Scooby Doo and Teen Titans. In February 2011, Dwayne died from complications of an emergency heart surgery the day after his 49th birthday. He was survived by his wife and his mother. Dwayne will be missed and will always be a part of the African American comic book culture. Have you checked out the Author's Corner lately? It's the best show you're not watching. Every two weeks, we bring you author interviews, news, and the best of the industry. With special guests, it's no wonder it's the fastest growing show around. There are two ways to check me out. Log on to my website at www.hdcampbell3.net on my YouTube channel at H.D. Campbell 1230. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Log on to www.hdcampbell3.net for showtimes, for links to the guest sites, and more. That's www.hdcampbell3.net. See you there. to you. How have you been since we last spoke? I've been 
That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. So how do we get to volume three? So when I spoke to you, we were in volume one. How did we get to volume three? Well, we finished up volume two. That was released in October 2012. Yeah, so now we're on to book three, volume three, and we'll quickly into volume four. Okay. Okay. That's a lot of updates. Okay. I like it. Now, um, Shamia, you are the uh, look for Superhero Huff. Explain to me, how did you get with Yorley and how did you guys get together for that? <laughs> That's actually an interesting story. I was out at a, well, you hear my child screaming in the background. Oh, but I was fine. out, <laughs> I was out on a, a kid festival and I was approached by the photographer Michael Cooper. He came to me and, and, and told me that, you know, I had a specific look that he was looking for and he asked if he could photograph me. So he took some photos of me and passed them on to Yorley and she liked what she saw. And when I saw the pictures on the internet of Superhero Hub, I couldn't believe my eyes that this cartoon character looked like me. Well, I'll tell you what, though. When I looked at your Facebook page, where it's, you know, the Superhero Health Facebook page, yes, you are definitely her. <laughs> so, no. So, no. So, that, so, so, so that is, so that is like, I mean, it's just uncanny. So, so, um, over the years, Yorley, you, since, well, well, since we've spoken, you've been on a lot of tours and everything. You've been well received. How does that feel? so much in such a short period of time but still there's yet much more to do um we are like tenaciously moving forward with a lot of different new products the superhero hub brand is turning into an entire enterprise an entity of its own we are um mentoring we have programs in a grammar school and a high school now and so we're just carrying forward with the uh, Superhero Huff message. All right. Now let's recap since it's been a minute we just, that since we spoke. Who is Superhero Huff and what's her origin story? Superhero Huff is an animated version of myself. I was, uh, this whole project started out of me winning a case against my employer. I was a former undercover drug agent here in Cook County, and I, I was discriminated against. I got evidence against my employer and filed a complaint internally, and internally threatened to kill me. Mm. I had to get my charges approved with EEOC, and after an 11-year legal battle, I won. So I initially started out with a memoir. Uh, it's entitled The Veil of Victory, and it is my autobiography. So then I self-published and, and distributed and did everything I could to promote, and still doing everything to promote the veil of victory. And then through divine intervention, I got the idea to animate my character into a comic book and a cartoon series. And so that's where Superhero Hub began. Okay. Now, what are Superhero Hub's abilities? If any of you guys can answer this. What are her, what are her abilities? Okay. Well, 
I want to uh, switch gears here just for just a second and uh, talk about your personal stories here. Um, first, um, was it was it the uh, case that got you to write your first book, or have you always wanted to write? Actually, I just wanted a movie deal and doing some work and getting some advice and consultation i was told that i needed a manuscript so then i began to write my autobiography in my mind it was the manuscript but it was the manuscript for a book <laughs> <laughs> it ended up being the manuscript for the book as well as the manuscript to pitch for a movie deal so I've been told that uh, the truth is stranger than fiction. And so for some people to believe that all that I have gone through, if they wouldn't have known me, they would have thought I was lying. So that's where the veil of victory came into play. Okay. Okay. Um, Shamia. Yes. All right. My question for you is, have you done any modeling in the past before you've gotten this role as Superhero Huff? No. <laughs> no formal modeling experience. Well, well, Not at all. Well, has this opened any doors up for you? It has. Um, I have started doing a few prints and I've done some fashion shows and things like that. But um, I That's what it's all about, blessings, which is going to move into my next question. Uh, Yorley, tell me, I've already asked you about the abilities and everything, but what what does Superhero Hub stand for? How many shows have you guys done so far together? Well, we haven't done one yet. We're going to do C2E2 that's coming up in April, and then we'll do Wizard World in August. All right. Where are you going to do Wizard's World? Wizard World is in Chicago sometime, I think, the first week in August or something. I'm not for sure the exact date. Right. Uh, you guys should you guys should have came here because we got Wizard's World coming here this weekend. Should have came when it was here. I'm gonna interview you guys there. <laughs> oh, let's see. Well, we want to get into uh, a type of routine and get our get our presentation together first, and then we try. We'll start traveling because there's a show in Philly, a black comic show in Philadelphia, and nice. uh, Detroit. They love to feel up in Detroit. So, and then we're going to do, uh, well, there's a show in Indiana, the Indiana Black Expo as well. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So, well, this brings me into my, it just brings me into my next question. And um, any of you guys can answer. Um, since I'm doing a black comic book show, that's basically what this interview is for, a black comic book show. Where do you guys see the state of black comic books as far as comic book writers, comic book artists? comic book heroes in general? Well, for me, I see it, um, I know that there has been a tremendous 
tremendous amount of black characters that have been in the marketplace for a long time, but without the deserving recognition and the acknowledgement as some of the non-black characters. So Superhero Hawk is on target and on focus to fill a mission, to fill that gap, to let our black black and brown children know that there is a color superhero that's in their favor and that they have someone that looks like them that's on the superhero circuit. So Superhero Hawk is uh, definitely going to be breaking sound barriers and strides and making the black comic arena taking it to a whole nother level. Okay. Now I have a two part question. One is for you one part one is for you, Yorley. The other heart the other part is for you, Shamir. Um you've created a wonderful superhero who's not stereotypical, which is one thing that I truly love. Um basically I guess I guess my question is how does that is there is there any roadblocks to do anyone actually see any stereotypes within her? Because I don't. No, she's actually one of a unique kind. Um, she is very versatile and flexible in that she is more, she's based on a true character, first of all. And she has superpowers, but they're naturally gifted powers. And that she is on a journey of life experience which will encompass and allow everyone to relate to her and she's not typical of a superhero character with a costume because of her chosen career which is an undercover drug agent and so she has the ability and she has the sex appeal but she has clothes on so she represents a very strong, gifted black woman who will do damage if necessary and then is prepared to start a war when needed. But she has the ability and intellect to penetrate all levels from corporate to espionage to ghetto street corner. You know, so she she truly is one of uh, one of a kind. So I love that. I love that. So my question now for you, Shamia, is how does it feel that you're playing a character that is very strong? Because see, one thing I will be totally honest with you: one thing missing in media in general are strong black women. So how does that feel to play them? Um, it, it, it's honoring to me to be able to show what what a black woman is really about, what a strong woman really needs to be, and, and, and be a good role model for kids to look up to, you know, someone that is powerful, someone that is intelligent. You know, I'm also God-fearing with that at the same time, and I really... I really want to be able to show young girls, teenagers, you know, women our age, you know, that you don't have to take off your clothes in order to get your point across or to be powerful and, and be able to show that unity that I feel is lacking in our society right now for women to be able to uplift each other and, 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 and empower each other. Sorry, my computer just jumping in. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, my, my baby is screaming in the background, so I'm a little distracted as well. I'm sorry. Oh, you're just fine. The baby's can be in the interview too. That's not a problem. It's a technical problem okay. I have an issue with. <laughs> but, but one of the things that I, I feel very passionate about is, is seeing women in, in position to encourage each other. A lot of times I see women tearing each other down and knocking each other down and you know, we all have the same issues. We all have issues with relationships and being mothers and, and 
you know, things that girls have to deal with in school and peer pressures and drugs and sex and, you know, it's so, it's so many things that's going on and where people feel like they're alone in the situations that they're in. And, you know, I want to glue all of that together and, and just show a versatility in a black woman, you know, that we're not just, I hope this doesn't sound too crass, but the, the booty shaking, boobs out chick in the video. Mm -hmm. That we are smart, we are strong, you know, we do hold our families down and, and hold it together. And I also want to branch out and show Superhero Hub cleaning up the street. There's a lot of, you know, gang violence and shootings going on and, you know, the baby that just got shot up the street. I, I mm -hmm. wish that I really could blow through and block those bullets. Oh, you're and in Chicago really, right now with a baby that cut? Yes, I actually mm. stay a few blocks blocks away from where that shooting just happened. Mm. And, you know, with the Hadia Pendleton story, that was down the street from me as well. So I, I feel very passionate about just bringing knowledge to the table and, and showing young people and, and minorities and that you can pick up a book instead of picking up a gun. And, and a lot of love needs to be shown. I feel like our city is lacking love right now. And I'm hoping that superhero hubs can show love and intelligence and just power. <laughs> well, actually, that, we're actually bringing up my next question in a way, but actually, it also adds an extra question to um, with what you just told me with, the, with that big headline about the baby getting shot and killed. What does that do for you, as far as as far as how? What does that? Cause see, cause see, for me, and I'm not even down the street like you are, but it just hurts my heart. How does that? How does that make you guys feel? That just bothers me. It, it bothers me. You know, it, being a mother myself, I can't fathom what the parents are going through with that situation. And, you know, it it's easy for us to be angry and, and you know, let's go get whoever did that. But I feel mm -hmm. like that's a part of, part of the problem. Absolutely. You know, it's, man, that's, that's such a heavy question. That's a heavy, loaded question. You know, my heart beats for it initially. But I feel like the... the the kids that are pulling the trigger that's holding the guns, they need love and prayer just as much as the victims are to, to cut this cycle. It's like a lack of love and, and a, a, a lack of knowledge that's happening. And the cycle is just going and going and going. I grew up in Inglewood where I was seeing the same mm. things. I would sit on the porch and play with my dolls and somebody would roll up and pow and somebody would get shot in the head right in front of my face. Mm -hmm. Now I know. Now I know we're talking about superhero huff. But I wanted to just do one more quick aside here, real fast. Um, and I think, and and if I know your early superhero huff is already doing this anyway, um, I'm sure superhero huff knows that not all gang members are ruthless. In other words, like to say, pray for them. A lot of them are out there with no choice. And I'm sure over the years she's helped quite a few of them. Um, so my, so, so, so this is a two part question. I know a lot of young boys buy comic books, but how many young girls come to the table? And any of you guys can answer this. Well, we have a cre increasing following of the young ladies, and I hope to increase that further because I've expanded the branding line, um, I have a couple different lines of t-shirts and posters. I've um, secured a fragrance for mm. our Superhero Huff. And I have like human tags, like the military tags. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, coming out with those and bracelets. So I am increasing the product line to catch the eye of our younger ladies, to attract them more to the comic book, not just the, not just using the comic book itself. And we're doing mentoring. I group, I mentor a group of six, seventh, and eighth grade young ladies at one of the South Side Public Schools in Chicago. And so, Superhero Hub will. Uh, we just started last week was our two weeks ago was our first meeting. And Superhero Hub is going to come in and engage the young ladies as well throughout our sessions. 
and we're just going to take them on a much needed journey about life. Maybe some of the things that they're not getting addressed at home, questions that they have, just to be able to say that as adults, we see you and we hear you and Superhero Hub in her totality is here for you. And that you do have someone you can lean on, that you can trust and know that we understand how you feel. We understand how you live and we understand the environment, but still at the same time saying that if we can make it out, because I'm a part of from K-Town, the West Side, uh, if we can make it out, that you surely can make it out. And so let us show you a different mindset, a different way of thinking about where you are so you can use that as a stepping stone. Okay, okay. Very good. So um, so my next question is, now you gave me a lot of information, but where can I find out more about both of you, Superhero Huff, get the t-shirts, everything? Well, right now you can reach us on the Facebook, Superhero Hub Facebook page is the best place. Uh, we are in the process of finishing up the Superhero Hub website where everything will be found. The Quickly Books and the Veil of Victory is on Amazon.com and SuperheroHub.com will be out very shortly. Okay. I'll put a, uh, I'll put a link out on my website. <laughs> As soon as it's out. Sorry. Uh, oh no, you're fine. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, I'm, so mad at me right now. Uh, well, well, for my last question, I'll let you go first because I know you have to. Go, <laughs> you have to go there. The, you know, you know, they're in charge. So I want to ask both of you ladies, and like I said, me, you can go first. Um, do you have any? Do you, do you have any last words of wisdom? Anything you want to say as far as anyone? who are trying to get to where you are now. Wow. Never stop believing in yourself. Your circumstances are just your circumstances. And, and the, the things that you go through in life are always a stepping stone to get you to your destination. And I, I believe that everybody is destined for greatness. And as long as you see that greatness inside of you, you'll be able to accomplish any goals, any dreams that that you desire. And just stay focused, and, and you'll make it out. You can always make it through any, any trial or tribulation with faith. Okay. And you early? My closing remarks would be that Everyone has a uniqueness about them, and they were put here for a reason. And they must understand that their gift is only for them, and they were put here for service. And so as the world waits on us to find ourselves, to walk on our journey, to find our paths, to be able to share this gift of service, that we are we are in the wings waiting, and so I say, come forth and be bold enough to walk in the unknown to get to that epiphany of knowing what the gift is and being able to share what that gift is because the world is waiting on you, and let nothing, not even death, stop you. Be so determined in your purpose that not even death can keep you from it. Well, before I go, while we're still recording, I just want to say this. We started out talking about Superhero Hub and the comic book and everything, but this conversation turned out to be so much more, and you two ladies are such a big blessing to be out there. And I really appreciate you both, not only for talking to me, but just for being an inspiration. So. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, guys. You you guys, you guys help me out. I really appreciate it. There's a great story about both of them. Both of them made And uh, while I did a drink, I was like, we're going to take a break. We're going to walk back, and then 
I'll be back with another piece of the floor, as well as we can do room over in a time like this. Thank you. Welcome back to the Office Corner with A.C. Campbell. I'm standing here with John Northley of Star Clipper Comedy. He's the assistant manager and person we have to thank for today's tour, as well as our journey here for our special Office Corner that we're doing today. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. All right. Doing all right? Yeah. All right. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Star Clipper, how long you've been in operation? Okay. Well, uh, Star Clipper has been a part of St. Louis for 25 years uh, currently. Our 25th year, and we're having like a celebration all year. I'm all about it. Um, so, established in 1988, uh, always in University City. We've moved a few times here and there. Um, now we moved here to the Loop maybe about eight years ago. And uh, yeah, we, we started off as kind of like a little hobby shop here. We expanded. We've got two plus of comics. We have tons of graphic novels. We have a lot of pop culture, famous stories. And uh, you said you do a little writing comics. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I write for a uh, for a group of, of, of upcoming independent writers and artists uh, called Literary Comics. Uh, I've participated in all the anthologies that have been released so far. There are six of them, five or six, uh, all of which you can buy here at the store and other locations in the St. Louis area. Okay, cool. What were some of your first uh, comics? Hmm, let's see. Um, I guess it depends on whether you want me to go to the official mark or the unofficial mark. Uh, unofficial mark first. I mean, okay, where, I mean wherever you get to start. So. I'm going to go back as far as I can remember. Hmm, I'm going to say um, it was probably one of the earliest cartoons I remember conceiving of was a, basically a Lost in Space ripoff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I forgot the exact title of the cartoon, but anyway, it was kind of, like I said, it's a, it's a lots of space ripoff. The idea was that, um, the family in space and, you know, their job was to put air in space. Yeah, I'm sure I would, that's not what I was a kid, so I didn't know any better. But anyway, <laughs> it's basically a ripoff of lots of space, family in space, they have their spaceship and they're supposed to fly around space putting air in space, so, you know, there could be air there. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. I like that. Well, what about officially then? Okay, officially, 
um, I'm going to talk about what you might call the um, the midway point between official uh, official and unofficial con card uh, career. Um, when I was in college, um, I think it was about nine, 1989. Let's say 1989. Um, I did a comic strip in the in the school paper called the Space Inn, which was kind of a spoof of the of the of the college paper itself, which is called the South Inn. And the Space Inn was basically a futuristic uh, version of the South End in the late 21st century. Okay. And what was that about, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, could you repeat that? And what was that about, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, um, like I said before, it's a, it basically is about, um, the Space Inn is basically about um, a college, about a college newspaper set about 100 years in the future. Nice. Okay. Pretty cool. So, at what point did Time Like Tunes get started? Oh, yeah, that um, that got started in, I'd say, April of 1991. That's when the, all the official stuff happened. And um, this was kind of a, no, this was definitely a turning point. Think about it, because um, one of the things that got me interested in doing the Time Like line is that the editor of the South End was some guy that I didn't like and like when he was running the paper and I said, I thought to myself, it's time for me to do my own paper. And by coincidence, I read this article in the paper talking about zines and you know small press comics and stuff like that. It's like, it was also kind of like serendipitous if you want to call it that. And so, you know, with that information and my desire to do my own publication, I decided to create what I call the Time Like Line 8, a magazine of science comic strips. Okay. Well, right now I want you to break down your various series in time, like uh, tunes, if you don't mind. I I went through them. I love them all, but I want you to break them down for my audience what they are. Mm. Yeah, but I got tons and tons of titles, but I guess I should just focus on some of the main ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think you could say the um, the flagship title is probably the science dimension. It's actually, the science, yeah, the science dimension is definitely it. And um, actually, I came up with the idea for the science dimension before I even started the time life line. But technically, um, the, science, the science dimension was never published in the time life line you know, publication, but it is related to the other comics published there. But anyway, the point is that um, the title line could be traced back to 1989 when I decided to write a novel called The Revenge of Science. Mm -hmm. And the premise, of that, yeah, the premise of that novel was uh, that some college kids got so pissed off with the anti-science culture that, we have, you know, that he decided to to create a science-dominated society in 20 years. And of course, he succeeds, uh, spoiler alert or whatever. Anyway, um, the science dimension actually takes, you know, kind of, kind of um, actually it does, it, it, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that it, it continues the science dimension, you know, what happens at the end of the science dimension, you know, where the science dimension ends, the, Oh, let me say this. Where the revenge of science ends, the science dimension begins. So you have the revenge of science where the science dominant society is being um, developed. And then you have the science dimension where you have a already developed science dominant society. Okay, cool. And just give me a couple of some of the other series in there. Um, let me kind of look around because... Um, even though I created these comics, I'm not sure where to, uh, where I should go with it or whatever. Well, I well, that, uh, look some stuff up. Well, let me, well, let me, well, let me just uh, break it. Well, well, let me just, um, just ask you like this: What inspires each of you? Whenever you decide to get an idea, what inspires it? Hmm. Um. Oh, I think I know what it is. Um. I guess what inspires, I'm not sure if inspires is the right word, but my focus is to create comics, you know, create, you know, create some kind of, you know, produce some kind of creative effort that's unlike what's usually, usually done. I mean, I'm sure some people like the old traditional stuff, that's fine with, you know, it's fine with them, but it's fine with me if that's what they like, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, creativity by definition means you have to do something that's not common, that's not um, done over and over again. Uh, you know, it was attempt, very attempt to do something that's never been done before. Hmm. 
Well, I'll tell you, one of my favorites is the Giantess. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that's one of my favorites. I just want to tell you about that. Um, also, too, I'm glad you wrote. I'm glad you said that because see, it, um, as I read as I read your profiles, I've done the homework on you. You're a very expressive person. You basically, how can I put this? You, well, well, from what I read, you're very you're very expressive. You're very intelligent. So it's like you and so oh that I mean that's all you, brother. So when you make these comics, unlike any other, I just think. I mean, I just think this is so cool. So I guess I'm wondering what I'm asking is, where does all that creativity come from, you think? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably, it's still, it basically comes from my desire to be creative, to do what's different. Because, um, you know, some people like what's, you know, they're not done to death, as I said before, and I'm not the kind of person who's really into that. I mean, I guess you could say I have a short attention span, a, what I call a true short attention span. I mean, you know, we could... People say, Americans have short attention span, blah, 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 blah. But as far as I'm concerned, most Americans have long attention spans because they are so, so, um, they are so complacent, so satisfied with the same boring stuff over and over again. But I'm not like that, so I go out of my way to, to be as creative as possible and, you know, look at, you know, try to get new ideas and stuff into my um, creativity. I think you're a lot like me. You know how people always say, let's think outside the box? Well, I don't think there is a box. <laughs> you know, first there had to be a box for me to think outside of. I don't put myself in boxes. So, no, so no, you're exactly right. So that's pretty cool. Um, basically, how much of you are in your time like tunes? And percentage-wise or, or what? Yeah, percentage-wise or however... Um, I guess sixty to seventy percent. Seventy percent. That's what I figured. I do see a lot of you uh, in time like tunes. So um, I guess I wouldn't have to ask what your favorite time like tune is. Mm. Um, uh, I'll say I can say that I do have some. Um, that might. I think it's more accurate to say that my favorites vary from time to time. And uh, I guess I could say that at this point in time, my favorite is Asteroid Spin, which mm. hasn't been published yet, but I've been trying to, been working on that for about a year. Okay. We'll get into that here in just a second. Uh, my next uh, thing is, uh, do you do any animation in a, uh, animation, or any plans for any animation? Yeah, but I've done some animation. Okay. What have you, what have you actually done so far? Mm. What's that? What have you done so far? Uh, okay, well, not, since I mentioned Asteroid Spin, I might as well mm. bring up the Asteroid Spin animation idea. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Is there any chance I can see some of it, or...? Uh, it's still there. All right, cool. Is it on your website? Well, it's on my YouTube site. Okay. Um, what's your channel, if you don't mind me asking? Um, let's see. Well, I believe it's... Um, time like zero one. Okay, if not, if not, I'll, I'll have it out and I'll post it for everyone. So that's so that's not a problem. Like I say, I, I love the time like tunes. Like I say, the Giants is my favorite one. Um, my next um, well, my next question is: Do you plan on promoting time like tunes more and getting it out there? Do you do any shows or events? Uh, years ago, I used to go to comic conventions, and I mean, the first comic convention I went to was pretty a pretty good deal. Um, I didn't sell a lot of comics, but it sells some, and I was pretty satisfied with that, even though it was a low number. But um, as time went on, it seemed like comic conventions were not working for me. It like you know, there was less and less interest, and then I decided no more comic conventions. And also, I decided no more print comics either, because you know, doing print comics is even worse, because it's so painfully expensive. Mm -hmm. And we have a ton of printed comics that cost a zillion dollars to make, and hardly any of them sold. Like, my last print comic was published in 2008, and I decided not to go back, ever. Well, I think also, too, uh, you, may agree, you may agree with this. For some reason, comic book 
I guess comic book conventions have become more widely commercial and yeah, the same thing. and yeah, pretty much. So it's like they're gonna become more commercial. Hollywood got involved, and now it's this whole big thing. So yeah, so that's one of the main reasons I really don't like them all too much anymore. Um, so if you don't do them, so do you do them digitally? If you don't do them um, on paper. Um, could you read that again? Uh, so do you do a digital time like tunes? Like on your website or do you, uh, can you sell them digitally or? Oh, well, right now most, most of our work is done by hand and I scan it in and uh, colorize it and so forth. But I also do some uh, computer generated uh, work and associate with, with the comics. Okay. Cause like, like I asked, my asteroid spin animation, for example, is uh, mostly computer generated. Okay. Um, who are some of your favorite artists in the uh, industry? In the industry. Mm, that might take a while for me to think because... Um, or outside the industry, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, hmm. I see. Oh, I just thought of somebody. Um, Dave Kirsch. Um, mm -hmm. He's like a, a small press comic artist. Um, I um, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with him and despite that I haven't really seen much of his stuff lately, but I was impressed with what, what I saw and do a few years ago. So I'll say Dave Kirsch is somebody I like. Okay, nice, nice. So um, do you see, so where do you see yourself in about maybe five years with uh, Time Like Tunes? It depends on what happens. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff can happen, but um, I, I guess we have to focus on a few things since this is a limited time interview. So let's say that if current trends continue in five years, um, I'm not going to say time like this is going to be a ginormous hit, but if current trends continue, it might be big enough so that um, that I'll consider myself a success. Whether maybe I'll probably I'll, I'll, I'll consider myself a success, but I might have moderate success at it. So as long as I'm successful, that should be what really matters. Well, I'm well. I'm about to tell you. I'm a fan. I read them. I mean, I'm looked at it. I mean, I'm I'm a fan. So you at least got one more fan. So that that's not a problem. Well, my my next thing is, how often do you update the website? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm like a lot of people, and I don't update my website that often. But the Time Like Two main site has been updated recently, like in the past in the past two or three months. I might have. Did an update every every couple of weeks or so. Okay, and what is the address for the main site? Okay, let's see. The main site is um, timelighttunes.tripod.com. Nice, nice, nice. So, um, and where can people find out more about you? Your, um, you know, get in touch with you or find out more about what you do. Uh, the main site should be um, where they can get the basic information. Okay. Um, and finally, um, do you have any um, final words uh, for anyone who's trying to, in other words, not basically, because I, I admire you because you're not doing yeah. what everyone else is doing. So do you have any word for someone who's trying to do that? Uh, I guess my only advice, my main advice is that you can't predict everything. I mean, um, a lot of experts will say they know what it takes to make a successful comic book or a successful TV show or a successful movie. And more often than not, those experts fail. I mean, that applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can't, or, okay, since that's the case, then you might have to look at the possibility of creating a demand for your work. So. You can either do things the standard way and fail anyway, or maybe succeed, or you can try something different and fail and maybe succeed. But ultimately, if you want to be satisfied with your with your art, you might want to and you want to be profitable at you might want to figure out a way to create a demand. And so far I have to figure that out, but I'm not saying it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So well, I want to thank you. You know what? I'll tell you. I'll tell you like this though. I also like the way you. I also like your way of thinking too. I mean, you just have this carefree attitude to where I just 
I just do what I do and that's it. You know, I, I love that. So thank you. I'm ready when you're ready. All right, so this one uh, is called Hammer. It's like the, the fifth or sixth release from the Lincoln Bridge Comics. So this one's a fantasy based book. So we have maybe like 10 stories. In mine, I have the uh, the longest title. Um, the, I actually have more lines in the intro uh, page. It's done on purpose, but uh, I'm going to show you right here. It's called the Remembrance of the King, the final stand of Rampage Alexander. So I wrote it with, uh, with a friend of mine, he, uh, he illustrated it. And it's a story about uh, of these, these guys, you know, they, they like to do LARPing, live action, and play. And so they're having fun with their wooden weapons and things. But when orcs, real live orcs, come in and they made their fun. So you can see right here, going on, starting here. And you have uh, the sort of people who are not prepared, so like, the referee gets cut in half, and you know, it goes on. And eventually, you know, you see that this board is coming out of nowhere. Whereas we have a few guys who are actually kind of suited for this thing. So they, so these group of five, four or five guys, they go and attack and fight back for humanity. And eventually, you know, it goes on to where the, the, the king captured but he, he, you know, he, he saves the day. That, I mean, that's really it. Just eight page stories that uh, were update pages that just kind of test what the writer can do, what the artist can do, and just to have fun. There's no limits or anything like that outside of what the theme is for the story. So again, this one was fantasy. And, you know, there are other ones like war and uh, crime and so on. So you believe the Bruce Williams story concluded in How to Lose a Black Woman? Well, Bruce Williams begs to differ. Find out what's been going on with Bruce Williams in the sequel titled Geraldine, coming soon. Do you need a manuscript edited? Perhaps you need a press kit or some ghostwriting done. HD Camel Productions will offer the most professional services at the best price. We also do book trailers, publicity, newsletters, and more. Check out more in the online marketplace section on my website at www.hdcampbell3.net. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Welcome back to the Office Corner, special black comic book edition. This is the segment of the show where I give writers and authors advice. The comic book industry is very hard. It's a lot easier for you to get in as an independent than it is to get into the mainstream, you have to start out independent. Um, you don't have to, sometimes, if you're able to get in, it's a lot easier for you to get in as and into the mainstream, but you have to a lot of times start as independent. Don't get discouraged. Comic book industry is very hard, and a lot of the companies rather you work on established characters. The next one, don't always expect a call from DC or Marvel. Being the big ones, they're going to always be the last to call. You're going to have to actually start with a Dark Horse or another comic book company in order to become one of the mainstream markets. The way it does it, a lot of people have done it. Now, finally, and I know I've said this in the beginning, but I have to say this twice, never, ever give up. Don't give up on your dreams, and uh, everything will be all right. Thank you for watching The Office Corner. Thank you very much. Peace, air grease, and as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Thank you.